So my name is Nakaja. I grew up mostly primarily in Washington, D.C. and the United States of America. Um, I was privileged to be able to have be exposed to African history um, within the D.C. public charter school system in America. And that kind of invigorated me to be to love education one and to be inspired by education. But as I grew older, I realized that having African, an African centered education isn't something that you will see in the American education system for a maraud of different reasons. Hello, and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewanfo. And I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. public charter school, charter schools indicate that it's more so private. So they were at the, the teachers were able to create a curriculum that was centered around that student body and who were African themselves and, and wanted to share that knowledge because they saw the worth in that. But outside of that charter school, you won't see that anywhere else as far as like, I didn't see it when I was living down South in America and I didn't see it when I got older. Um, in high school or in college, unless I was specifically intentionally trying to take those types of courses. And then even then, a lot of times when you are in university, you have um, sometimes white people, Europeans, like British people, um, people who are German, whatever the case may be, who are teaching African history or African politics or whatever the case may be. So when that is happening, the narrative is going to be one that makes them the victor or which makes their them and their people um, look better than the African people themselves. So it's not coming from an Afrocentric perspective. Um, and then even when I was in the Air Force Academy, um, they don't really focus on any type of history outside of uh, military history or, or war history either way, right? So, so this learning of the an Afrocentric way of or or African history is kind of obsolete now, nearly in societies. Um, so that's why I, I've been inspired to create something called the United Association of Moors, and it has a, an LLC called Moore SERP, which was dedicated to creating a search engine for African people to be able to easily find um, the information that helps them learn about who they are. So we're talking about African scholarship, African literature, um, and African resources, what are the African businesses that exist worldwide that um, can help me be able to be more African owned and I'm only buying from African people. So this was the kind of concept behind it because I saw that in our current societies, that's something that's currently suppressed severely. Um, but I, I think the group consciousness is beginning to change, but that's a little bit about Thank you so much. That is really uh, very interesting to, to see. All right, now let me hang on a little bit um, as you were still growing up uh, a little bit in DC area. So what kind of information were you receiving from your parents? They tried to give you a background of, of who you are. Yeah, so actually my great-grandfather, Harold, Harold Lee the Bethune II, he was actually someone that was really into... Um, African people, like protecting the African people. He was someone who ran for governor in Louisiana, and he was very serious about um, the deliberation of African people and, and representing the African people because he saw where we were at mentally. Um, so I, I would say that something like that runs in my family, like that, that leadership role that is needed within African communities, and especially as it pertains to what's going on in America. Um, alongside, like, most of my family, like, they're just well-educated in a variety of different topics, but my uncle, he's really into um, similar similar information as far as like history. We have like indigenous people in our family, so he knows all of that different stuff. So this is a lot of the things that I was um, exposed to at a young age, different stories that were told to me um, by my elders, so. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. All right. Now, uh, you're still a little bit younger this time. You are still beginning to, to find yourself in the society. So among your peers, among your friends, as you go out, what kind of conversation will sort of help you in this area? You are not yet ma you are mature now, as you are talking to me, but I'm talking of then, as you were trying to find your feet on the ground, what kind of information will you, like, assess? I'm trying to understand a young person growing up in the United States, say in your in DC area, uh, the kind of information that you generally receive, yeah. I think it was like my experiences with people. I've always kind of been someone that kind of was separate, separated from the crowds of people. So it was really my experiences with these crowds of people. Like, for example, the middle school I had went to that had an Afrocentric curriculum. Well, something that I got to experience and I even analyzed today is the concept of the crab barrel theory, right? Because of how things were situated in that school, they had a um, they had like a hierarchy of intelligence nearly. And I don't, I don't really want to call it that, but that's really what it was. They, they tested the young people. And if you tested high on the test, you were put in a specific class. And if you tested low on the test, you were put in a lower class. And what that did was that it caused a, a hierarchy amongst middle schoolers. Can you imagine? And we didn't realize it at the time, but the people who had tested low and were in the lower classes would really pick at and bully the ones that were in the top classes, right? Because they kind of give this inferiority and superiority, su superior complex. And what that what that was, it's like almost emulating the same systems that we were a part of. Um, once we joined white society, it wasn't very like communal right? It, it was you separating or dividing a group of people. And when realizing things like that, when I'm older, that that's kind of what I learned from. And then experiencing things of being, you know, called different things by your, your fellow counterpart that looks like you, you get to understand um, the severity of the psychological slave trauma that exists in our people. And even at young ages, like, you know, when you have people in your in your community that's, you know, arguing with you or bullying you about being a certain skin complexion, well, you have to think, you know, like they, they must have been taught that in the home, one, and then two, they must struggle from self-hatred. And the famous intellectual Amos Anna Wilson actually wrote a book on this called The Psychology of Self-Hatred, um, how to reactivate uh, the Africanness, the psychological African, Africanness of a person. And it's really, I think that's a really good book for people to read because you really get to understand how our decisions are shaped by our environment and how that makes us think the way that we do. And that's exactly what I got to see at young ages like that, even into high school, seeing like how people self-sabotaged themselves or separated themselves for the current curriculum because they didn't see themselves represented in the curriculum. Like I, I learned more so from the experiences I had with people, less so from quote unquote friends, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And of course, I thank you so much for that. That is very important because, of course, now as we are currently speaking, we are speaking as adults, we are mature, we have gone through a lot of experience. And so we have formed our opinion and they are very solid. There is no doubt about that. So, of course, I'm still uh, trying to see when we were still younger, growing up, uh, sort of influences that we have around us. Those ones also have a lot of uh, impact on how we shape our realities. Uh, so probably this is the last question I'm going to ask you related to that before we move to the current state into what you are doing, looking at cultural storytelling and all of that. So uh, looking at maybe books that you could read, because these uh, books have a lot of influence also on people, on what kind of um, book do you have to read. Uh, so tell me, what kind of books were you having access to as you were still growing or maybe going to secondary school? Tell me about that. Like, was there any books that actually influenced you in a particular way that you got to read, you saw some way in the library or things like that, R related yeah. to African history, yeah. Yeah, I remember, like, we were told to read things, like, in, in middle secondary school, things by, like, Aladu Aquino, um, the narrative of Aladu Aquino, uh, which was really impactful, was really sad. Um, he, he was someone that was actually taken from uh, West Africa and brought to the Americas and he had remembered it. Um, he, he remembered 
nearly everything and he remembers the time that he was taken the time it's like he witnessed people getting beaten a certain way is specifically women and being raped and how he couldn't do anything and he remembers you know just being in fear of his life because what he saw was happening around him to the people that looked like him and when he got the chance to be able to not be treated in that way he documents that he took it, he took that chance, right? And and how that made him feel and how that made him, you know, weak inside and things like that. And I just remember hearing and, and reading how gruesome um, that story was at such a young age. It, it was um, it was daunting and and it enraged me to want to change it. Um, we, we used to read primary sources from different European explorers and things like that that used to go into different places around the world let's say like the Americas for example and uh, describe the people that lived there who were African but they would like identify them as Indian or or whatever the case may be and then describe them as being savagery or or whatever the case may be so we would do things like that I also remember reading uh the autobiography of Malcolm X, like we used to read things from Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah, um, Kwame Ture, uh, so many different things at such a young age. And we were being, ex- we were just being exposed with this like African, pan-Africanism and, and almost African consciousness and in, in nationalism that existed on a global scale. So, and we used to be told African stories, almost like our teacher would be kind of like a griot at, at, a, um, at that age too. So it, it was really, really interesting. So he used to tell us the story of Nefertiti, Nefertari, all different types of stuff. So it was very, very well engaging. All right, thank you so much for that. Now we are in the story. Uh, tell me, personally speaking, uh, those information that you had access to, those books that you made mention of, and those people who came to tell you about African story, how much impact did it have on you? And how much impact do you think have on the people as they grow up? Yeah, I think it, it hit other people differently, but I was actually in the eighth grade when... Um, Trayvon Martin was killed, right? And I remember we had this student in our class that she was she was black, but she wanted to be white or something. She had some type of complex, right? That happens sometimes. You have some African people that will swear that they're white or swear that they're not African. And she was one of them at a young age. And I remember her saying something to the effect of, oh, that's what he gets. Like, he should have never had a hood on. He probably had a gun, whatever the case may be. He got what he deserved. And he was killed by a police officer that I think was off duty, right? George Zimmerman it was. And I was just so, I was like, how could this happen? Like, he was nearly our age at the time. And I was upset. And then when she said that, it was like a, a surge of rage came over me. And then I saw that everyone around me in my class wasn't saying anything everyone was silent and I was the only one who was like willing to like like go to battle with her right then and there because I was like how could you say something like that and you're in a school that's predominantly African right it doesn't make sense and and in that mindset like was just so it like broke my heart because it was like that was a young African boy you know what I mean and I think that that um example describes how the information we were being told impacted me versus other people. Some people, it just made them want to be, and and I'm writing a manuscript on this now, but it wanted them to assimilate into this hierarchy, right? It just wanted them to become the oil of of the machine which oppresses our people. It scared them. Like, like they were running off of fear. A lot of them ended up running on fear and, you know, they just want to protect their nuclear family if even they can do that, right? So they're just trying to join the capitalist system. Some people will um, try to, what, what's the word, deflect from being African, like turn away from it, submerge themselves with their white counterparts, whatever the case may be, want to integrate. And then the other option is to, is to, want to uh, create unity amongst your own people and want to educate your own people and empower your own people so you can create your own communities and institutions. And I think that's the three things you got. You got fear, you got the assimilator, and then you got the warriors. 
Thank you so much for that. All right. Now, I talk to you as a scholar, so I'm going to ask for um, a definition from you. And the term Afrocentrism is something that a lot of people uh, make use of. And I think you have made mention of it up to like two times in your explanation. Can you give me a definition of it or a description of it? What does it mean by Afrocentrism or Afrocentric? Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, a person that coined that was um, Professor Malifi Ashante, who's currently at the Temple University. And I had the pleasure of talking to him recently. And how he described Afrocentricity is being anyone can be a part of the this paradigm of Afrocentricity, right? Like, it's the idea of bringing agency to a group of people who have been discriminated against and, and to bring in the narrative that has been um, silenced nearly, right? Our, our narratives have been silenced for hundreds of years. So it's, it's bringing an agency to the African perspective. And it, but it's not really only for the African perspective, it's for the global community. Because being African doesn't mean that you're just only prioritizing African, you're prioritizing humanity, right? Because what's happened to our communities is inhumane. It's a form of genocide, although the genocide convention won't, won't uh, realize that or say that, right? So that that's really what it is. It's bringing agency um, to a group of people who have been harmed. Uh -huh. So you said that um, the word genocide would be used in terms of how the African have suffered. I don't know. That. Can you say something more about that? Because looking at uh, today, of course, we talk about uh, six million Jews that were uh, massacred by the Nazis. Uh, but if you look at Africa, far more than that have actually happened, but we don't usually use the word genocide to describe what has happened to the African people. So I'm trying to understand in what context are you saying uh, it's not really used, is that it's not qualified to be used, or help me understand that. Yeah, so I was actually talking to a, a professor recently, um, his name is Jeremy Gunn, and he's currently in Morocco, uh, where I am, and we were discussing and he, he was someone who had studied law and he was actually in the law field in DC and for constitutional law and human rights. And I was asking him, okay, so could the African people sue um, sue the corporation United States of America for the their genocide that has been placed upon them. And they were like, he was like, oh, well, it, it's not feasible. You can maybe sue them for the mass murder, but even then you have the ex, ex, post facto, ex post facto laws that need to be considered, right? Because there's a certain time frame that you can't go back in the past and say that, oh, you're trying to sue these corporations or this corporation for the illegal slave trade. And especially if it wasn't illegal at that time, although that it was, right? We know that. But then he was talking about how there are certain states that did have it legalized. And the way that they were able to go around that is because they created laws. They created legal codes to say that African people were considered three-fifths of a human. So technically, it wouldn't have been illegal at that time because they had created those types of laws. Um, and then alongside with the whole genocide thing, the Genocide Convention was created in, in 1940, and it was specifically created for the case of what was happening to the Jewish people um, in Vienna. So they like that, that's particularly what that was for. And if we wanted to sum up everything that happened, like in, in not only in South Africa, but across the continent of Africa, including the in the Americas and the Africans that were brought to the Americas, he was saying that it, it would not be considered, it would be nearly impossible to be able to do that, which I think is absurd because that what has happened to the African people embodies, embodies the definition of genocide, right? And then it goes into the case of, of trying to prove it and trying to create those statistics and to lump some of them together. So what I realized in the conversation I was having with him is what he was doing was um, dividing, dividing up what happened. He was like, oh, well, if you want to say that, and then not to even mention the current legal cases that's been going on with different um, American corporations that have fundamentally failed when you get try you get you're trying to get African people to sue different um, corporations in America and and it's just 
it's not going through, right? Because they have, these white companies have protections on them. Like the recent case of that is uh, Nestle, Google, Apple, all these different things for child slavery, um, even and child trafficking or human trafficking in general. Like they're, they're not being prosecuted because the people who created the law, it was created to protect them. It was, it was created to protect Caucasian people and Caucasian interests. It wasn't, it wasn't created to protect African people, right? On, on any scale, it wasn't created to protect the African in America and it wasn't created to protect humanity in general. It was only created to protect a, a specific group of people. Um, but in, in the case of, oh, so in the case of the division goes, he was saying like, oh, well, if you wanted to prosecute the corporation for genocide of the indigenous Native Americans, then you can do that. But from what my, my um, scholarship tells me is that the Native Americans didn't identify themselves as Native Americans. They were indigenous, yes, but a lot of them look just as African as the African that's in Nigeria. Do you understand? So it's like, it's, it's that div divisiveness and those racial terms that start to confuse and to try to make it almost impossible to be able to prosecute these types of institutions. And then another thing he tried to do is say, oh, well, think about Barack Obama. Barack Obama didn't have descendants of slaves. So even if you were to have that type of legal case and it was to go through, and then you were able to have reparations, which I think the correct term is restitutions, not reparations, would it go to people like Barack Obama who never had descendants of slaves? So how are you gonna find all the people who had descendants of slaves and didn't have descendants of slaves, right? So it was a lot of confusion as to that, like creating confusion as to how that, that would go about. And that's the state that we're in. We're in the state of confusion. Like, so that gives you a little bit of All right, so and that state of confusion, if we understand it perfectly, is actually created to be like that. So at least it helped the person who is um, uh, who is oversee the confusion to get a better advantage of it. Uh, mm -hmm. at, so a couple of uh, weeks ago, actually it should be over a month ago now, I interviewed uh, a historian in UK uh, of, uh, of a Jamaica origin. Her name is Selena Carty. And she said exactly what you're saying, you know, uh, because we talked about law, we talked about also history. In that way, you make the law, looking at the case of the European descendant who are supposedly the lords of this world, when they make the law, they make the law to protect themselves. They didn't make it to protect other people. So when other people then come and say, oh, you break the law, it becomes very difficult for them to get justice. So that, mm -hmm. uh, like um, uh, Ben was also saying, the, the famous historian, what you are getting is just this, not justice. Is we cannot get just we cannot get <laughs> justice from there. You are only going to get just this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's let move a little bit towards uh, the the project that you are working in, which is the cultural narrative, the cultural storytelling. Tell me how it started and uh, what exactly you are aiming up with this project. Right. So, current how did it start? It started from. Uh, I, I can't even coin when it started. I think it started when I was in the military and when I noticed that African people seeking their own history and their own knowledge that empowers their identity is something that's taboo for white societies. And when they see you doing it, it's, it, it brings upon a fear in them. They're like, oh, okay. Like, like she knows who she is, right? Like, so that, that got me intrigued with the idea of learning more, even more about myself, and not only learning about my history and finding my, my own narratives that were taught by my own ancestors, but getting other African people to be inspired to learn that as well. So I, I think it, it really started then, once I had um, left the military and, and I started to get engaged with with the content that was fulfilling me which is learning about what my elders what my ancestors had left me it's, it's not like everything that we need to do as African people has already been done and already been well documented by by our, our elders and our ancestors who have passed away which is a beautiful thing so I was just trying to tap into that but the unfortunate thing is is that there's not a lot of people in our communities that are that are interested or that are aware of that because they don't see any benefit in it. They don't see any benefit of, of knowing who they are, knowing what their ancestors left them. Um, 
but that's kind of what started it. And currently the project that I'm working on is I'm, I'm trying to capture the narratives and the stories of indigenous people on the continent. So I was just in Ghana and I was able to understand a bit more about different ethnic groups that live there. And I was really documenting the effects of westernization and globalization on their communities. What has it changed as far as their traditions and their languages and, and whatever the case may be? Because I, I think that is uh, an, an important thing to realize that in this age of, of the digital era, in this age of globalization that is having a profound impact on Africa, which a lot of people don't understand in the diaspora. Um, and especially as it pertains to urban areas. So what I what I have been realizing is that, for example, in Accra, the people complain about the corrupt government system, but are also in itself emulating that government system. And I think it, it has to do, it's a theory of mine, that it has to do with having this, you know, this system of capitalism, right? They're trying to survive. It's literally like they're mimicking the dog eat dog complex that's going on, right? So um, it, it's it's really having a, a negative impact on the, the traditions of communalism and taking care of each other and, and all different things. And, and I'm assuming that this is happening across the, the continent in urban areas specifically. Right, so I'd imagine in Lagos that that's the same issue that's going on. Um, in in Casablanca, I, I want to say I, I I was in Casablanca and now I'm in Rabat. I would say that the same the same thing is going on. Right, the 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 neocolonialism is having a, a depreciating effect on the morality of uh, African communities. Yeah, you correctly said that a lot of people are not interested in knowing about the history of Africa, the history of themselves, because of course, by a lot of people, we are here referring to the African people. Uh, now, uh, what I'm sort of worried about is that, is it possible that the, because of how the Africans have been reduced, you know, for people to be talking about history sometime, you need to take care of the primary existential thing necessities, no? You need to have food, you need to have uh, shelter, you, you, then you can begin to talk about philosophy and some other things uh, in the ordinary sense of it. Of course, there are some people who go against some of those things and still able to come out with something extraordinary. So if you look around nearly the whole of Africa, you see that people are barely surviving. And because they are barely surviving, I think it fits perfectly to what, what you are referring to as dog eat dog. In, in that anything can go. And if we remain on this uh, edge of precipice, or oh, where we are just, we are basically falling, you know? it's just a question of who's going to get to the ground first, it becomes very difficult for people to really stand up and say, where are we really coming from? Because the basic things have not been taken care of. If you are mm -hmm. a man, your wife and your kids are, they don't have food to eat, you might really want to stand up for something, but because those things are there that are dragging you, it becomes very difficult. Anyway, this is just my reflection. What do you mm -hmm. take of that? Is it that we as a people, we just naturally do not like to know about ourselves or because we are under a situation that is making it difficult for us to know about ourselves? I'm looking at Africans yeah. in general, also in the diaspora. Yeah, so I think that I said, okay, I'll give an example. I remember one time I was talking to a young man and I was telling him about, you know, he, I think he may have said something that had triggered me. So I was telling him about our history and what's going on with the African people. And as I was explaining it to him, he didn't, he didn't debate me because he knew it was true. And he said, well, you know what? Uh, I don't want to talk about that because once I once I think about it and once I talk about it, I'll be enraged, right? And that wasn't the only time I've heard about that. So I think that it, it's almost intentional for African people to not want to reflect on actually what's going on because it's easier. It's easier to be docile and complacent with the situation than you're in than to fight out of fear. Like I said, it goes back to that fear complex. And I think that What's going on in the Horn of Africa and in different places, honestly, is uh, you, you, you don't have to choose a house. You, you don't have to choose the basic necessities 
or your identity or your dignity. Like you don't have to do one or the other. You can do, you can have it both. Like, why do you have to choose? And I think the way that that happens is for us to prioritize unity and community. I think a lot of things that are happening and why things are able to get away as to what's happening on the continent or within the diaspora everywhere, because there, there's injustice everywhere, um, because the, this globalization in, in the form of um, neocolonialism is taking an impact everywhere, whether we realize it or not. Um, is that uh, we're basically being, we have to unify. And in, in, in order for us to unify is that we have to be able to understand what the actual issue is. What is the common denominator? The, the tyrannical uh, president or, or person that's in power right now is just a manifestation as what happened in colonial times. And he's only an agent of a system, right? And once people are able to realize that type of information, then the argument doesn't become over my tribe is better than your tribe or my ethnic group is over your ethnic group. It's like, nah, like this person, this person is, is only one piece of the puzzle or this argument is only one piece of the puzzle. We need to look at the, the grandeur the, the bigger picture. And, the, and I think that that can happen once you have people within the diaspora caring as to what's going on outside of their bubble, of their box that's, that's happening. So a lot of people aren't well educated in America at like period, that's the statement. They're not well educated. People think that you can get proper education in America. It's not true. That's a fallacy. That that's just what they <laughs> this is what they want you to believe. The only type of proper education you can get is the education you get for yourself. One, two, um, people aren't educated as to what's happening on the continent. They may have these different stereotypes they 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 know of, but they don't know to the the intricacies as to how European countries put these types of situations in place. Like for example, the Congo. I, I just wrote an article as to the case in Congo where there's a, a um a group of people who a group a group of families who are trying to sue these big tech companies for basically um, child slavery. And it's probably ongoing to this day. And like I said before, they weren't able to get prosecuted for it because there's um, legal codes that's protecting those types of institutions. But they, the reason why Congo is in such a destitute state that they're in is because they, the, pat, the historical past as to how colonials in the past were able to use the, the divide and conquer technique to get the Congo in the position that it's in. So they didn't even have the, the resources, the human resources or the military resources to protect themselves, right? So then they caused strife in Rwanda and then that caused a whole nother strife to go on within Congo. So all these things are interconnected and once we're educated on those things, it can help us better want to assist each other and want to unify with each other in order to get to the actual, the actual root of the problem and, and identify solutions. And that's the only way. So I look at it as this, for example, the Africans are like, the door, the locked door, right? And then the other Africans in the Americas and within the diaspora is kind of like the key to that, to that locked door. Together, they are able to open up into, and you're able to utilize that doorway to get to the, to the next step and then forward on to all the other doors that exist. But without each other, they're useless. It's just a locked door and a key. You understand? So if, if we were able to get the diaspora educated as to what's going on and get them to have an African consciousness that's centered towards unity and wanting to help each other and to empower each other, then it would be easy for the diaspora to be able to create funds to help the Horn of Africa and not only to help, but to help themselves, to build communities together, to go far. Like we could go far with each other, but that that's the whole mentality of an African consciousness, but you only have that's idealistic what I'm saying. So you only have a critical mass of people who will want to do that. And that's the state that we're in now. So it's gonna take um, a much slower and gradual process. Uh -huh. It's gonna take much slower and gradual process. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna take a gradual process. To be able to get to where we are going, uh, how much importance does understanding history plays here? Before you respond, I want you to pay attention to what happened in Nigeria. 
Up until recently, history was actually taken away from curriculum in Nigeria. Now you will ask yourself, okay, what could be the reason behind that? Nigeria is known, okay, I know, I believe that we are not free. But we have a kind of a semblance of freedom in that at least we do organize our election. Why could history be taken away from the people, not knowing about themselves? What would be the importance of history, knowing about yourself, in finding our own route in this world? I don't know if the question was a little bit confusing. No, 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 it's not. So that's an important point. And we talked about the, who, yeah, I, talk, I talked about that with um, one of my business partners, Ikuma, and he's in, in, in Nigeria too. And he discussed um, history and, and how it had been taken away, but also the fact that it, it was shaped by um, British colonials who are still very heavily involved in Nigeria. But um, we have to understand that history, like, yes, they call it history, but the the past tells us what happened before because it is going to repeat itself, right? Things are are cyclical. Um, that That's why you have people who are into um, different religions and they study sacred texts because it's not useless right? Like, think about it. Those are, like, ancient texts that we're reading or, or that or that we've tried to preserve and we continue to read because it, it doesn't become obsolete because a lot of those stories are stories of wisdom, things that have happened and things that will take root again. That's why you have a lot of people who reference, for example, the Bible or the Quran or um, the Torah, right? You, you have people that reference these things because the past never just goes away it it, it it comes around again things aren't linear how you know the western education system wants you to believe it's circle it's cyclical right and the past the history tells you the past and it dictates your future you're able to either you study the past and you're able to know okay what's going to happen and you uh, you become docile and you let that that past repeat itself or you change that past and you create a different future and then you create a whole nother cyclical wave that's going on um so that that's kind of that's kind of the concept of history and that's why it's important so if you're able to take someone's um past and history and, and education systems away you're able to control their future does that make sense yeah, yeah, of course, it does make sense. It does make sense. And now, uh, cultural storytelling, that is a conversation that we are having uh, just now. Uh, can you say something about the term itself, cultural storytelling? Can you break it down a little bit? Okay, cultural storytelling just entails being able to give people the opportunity to tell their own stories and their own um, dialects in their own ways, right, of, of their own traditions, and being able to share those stories with other people, because I believe everyone has a story, and a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't like that, or a lot of people don't think so, I don't know, my, my life is pretty, it's pretty, you know, simple, pretty original, like, it's, it's the same old be all, but the thing is, is that storytelling is, is so important and it's, it's, it's vital because it's not about us seeing ourselves as, oh, we're the best or I had an amazing story, let me like write it down or whatever the case may be. No, it's about documentation and documenting your own story because when you don't document what happened in your lifetime, best believe someone else is, you know what I mean? And it might not be the way that you like it. And, but by that time, it'll be too late. Another thing is that it's important to storytell your own narrative and it's for your own legacy, your own community, your own children. You can pass that down. So I, I really harp on cultural storytelling and being able to capture other people's stories that may not have the time or want to because we're in a space where African people can recreate our own narratives and retell our own stories in a way that, that has truth to them and in a way that actually aids to the African interest. So that's the idea of, of capturing people's stories and narratives. I'm, I'm a 
an anthropologist and I'm into um, international economics. So, so, but really the harp on it, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, I'm an African anthropologist, right? So I, I come into it with entirely different intentions as to why it was created, but it's really to preserve our culture and the diversity of our culture. There is unity and diversity, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, absolutely. At least more than 100%. <laughs> All right, now. Uh, how simple is it to even dig up African history so that we can understand it? Now, you see, this is very important in that in history, uh, African history, some people think that it has not been documented, but actually it has been documented. It's just that it has not been documented in a way that we think it was documented. Uh, you see, when people write, they write for themselves to understand it. They don't really write in coded way for some other persons to understand it. Now, for you to understand it, you are going to have to decode what they are telling you. Right. Now, how do we dig up African history? Because this is the foundation of human being. That they understand how to organize a society. Science, astronomy, physics, biology. Think of anything. But today, we are looked upon as stupid people who have never done anything at all. And also, because... We are expecting that other people will come and probably tell us our history, maybe looking at a document from Harvard University or uh, maybe uh, somewhere in Paris or maybe somewhere in Vatica. But it's never going to happen. This is our job and it's a very tedious one. So I repeat the question again. How simple is it to dig up African history so we can understand it? Yeah, I, I definitely, I know, I want to address the point. I guarantee everybody who ends up listening to this podcast that once you change the narrative, when you have, when you speak to someone of a different ethnic group and they try to make you feel like your you, your people are stupid or inferior, whatever the case may be, once you change that narrative with that person, they will go silent, right? The, the point is, is that we believe in that fallacy. Some people believe in that fallacy, but once you don't believe it and you know what actually happened, they go silent, right? Okay, so then to your to your point about how difficult it is, it's very difficult, right? There, that's why you have it's an entire field of study: um, archaeology, anthropology, linguists, uh, historians, all these different things. All these people are in their own field work trying to decode it right because it is so intricate and it's not only related to um africa it, it because of all of the confusion that has taken place information is is dispersed everywhere right like you have the americas that that have african history and intertwined in it you have Asiatic countries that have history that's intertwined in it. You have um, even the Middle East that has history that's intertwined in it in, in European countries that have African histories that are intertwined in it. So all of it is is so decoded and it takes so much time that um, there's no plausible way to get it in one lifetime because it's, it's over hundreds of, of thousands of years that, that you would have to decode and, and read the code because someone else came and wanted to create meetings in order to change histories, right? That's what happened with the Bible. You had the Council of Nicaea where people wanted to change the way that sacred texts were written and they wanted to write a certain people out or or curse a certain people, right? Um, in writing. So it, it takes a lot, right, to be able to mesh things together and to understand things on a on a globe on a on a scale that is accurate but then that's why you have to always continuously research and do readings and and it's a it's a it's a lifetime it's it's a lifetime's work that is always ongoing and it and it really helps when there's a lot of people or everyone who is doing this type of work essentially so it's very difficult mm -hmm. okay it's very difficult but we are going to have to do it anyway because it is our job 
Now, when you go around, because you did mention of going to Ghana, Accra, uh, going to some other part, you are in, in Morocco, and in some other part of Africa, you have gone as an anthropologist, as a researcher, okay, also as a businesswoman. And, but anyway, let's concentrate more on the anthropology of the history, re research, and digging up of this data, this information. What do you find among the people? When you look at their faces, what do you see in terms of what you want to understand? Mm, what do I see in their eyes of the people? I want to, I think what I'm seeking is what was the fire, like the, the passion to want to um, rebuild something that's sustainable for them and their children. That's really what I, I'm, I'm looking for and seeking. But when I'm talking to different um, people on the continent, I hear a lot of times that they 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 have stories that's been passed on to them orally, and and they have these stories of resistance and things like that. But they're currently in a state where, you know, they don't want to risk their lives. And I'm seeking for the the people to be in a state where they can no longer take the the oppression that's going on, and they're ready to rebuild something for themselves and not wait for a government to do it. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. All right. Now, looking at the opportunity of because story is also um, how do I call it? That it's also a lot of money to be made by just telling our story. In that. Uh, you look at a lot of uh, movies that have been done on stories of on the, the experiences of people. If we have a lot of books being written about our story, we will also make money from it, apart from just educating ourselves about our past. Okay, you, being a businesswoman and also an anthropologist, a historian, a researcher, where do you see opportunity in the telling of our story? cultural storytelling, where do you see the people being able to benefit from it? Yeah, so, I mean, if we're talking about benefiting from it financially, that's an interesting concept. If you want some fiat money from your storytelling, let's talk about it. Um, it's possible, right? So a lot of, a lot of like, I don't know if you know about Marvel, but a lot of people are interested in Marvel, but a lot of times those stories come from, African stories or like because you have to keep in mind that white people intentionally went into these before they were able to colonize um, Africans they actually went into these African countries and learned from them learned their histories learned their religions learned all different types of things they even you know like the first European like Europeans like the Socrates and the Plato and all those people that were coined as being these big intellectuals learned in ancient Kemet, you know, from the Kemites, priests and everything like that. So a lot of these stories that we get to see today in the, the entertainment industry, um, of movies and TV shows come from African stories, right? And like the sci-fi industry, for example, Superman is is said to be related to um, uh, uh, Amen, Osiris, Asar, Aset, you know, things like that, that is ancient Kemet and they paint themselves or they actually carve themselves out of stone, which is as dark as the night, you know what I mean? And then you also have, uh, a new movie, Maleficent, who actually, frankly, call themselves, identify themselves as the Moors, and she's in all black, but she's a white woman. Like <laughs> that's our history, and then they're showing it in in a way that um, it's obvious, but only if you study who you are. And I think that's the state that we need to get in, as if we want to make fiat money out of it, is that we can definitely storytell in a way that is beneficial to us, but it that it takes like a lot of investment, right? And then also the idea of um I think even Black Panther, Black Panther was made a lot of money, but it was a white company who was able to get all those proceeds. You had some African people that were able to get hundreds of thousands of dollars, sure, but the company that made all the billions wasn't wasn't black, you know? So it's it's um it's a lot that you can get out of our own storytelling and doing our own comics and writing our own books. Like if, if we so want that, right. So 
that's an also interesting concept because a lot of these, specifically the sci-fi stories, a lot of the sci-fi stories they're taking from traditional stories that are seen on the continent. Um, that's not it, but even like certain documentaries that people make, like you have to look at where who are the pro production companies and what do they look like? They're taking stories. Um, and, and that's also another problem because then in itself, they're able to not only control the narrative, but be able to profit off of the narrative. Um, and, and America is the only one that does that. You also have um, other other countries that end up doing that as well that I've noticed. So it's a, it's a big industry. All right. It's a big industry. So, we do, you know, the continent of Africa is actually overblazed. For another one million years to come, the resources will never finish to be tapped into. So it depends on us, actually. It depends on us to organize ourselves and begin to know that we are sitting on top of diamond. And that diamond, we can either mine it for ourselves or we can just be crying while other people come and start mining it under our feet. All right, yeah. the malls. You made mention of it just now. Tell me something about the United Association of Malls. That is a project that, uh, that you have, that you are organizing, right? All right, so... The United Association of Moors, we focus on community development, sustainable innovation, renewable energy, and education. And, there, and I would like to start with the sustainable community piece, right? So we our, our idea is that we want to create communities in a space that prioritize communalism and prioritize Ubuntu, which is I am because we are. We want to exist in a community where we can trust each other and in order, once we're able to trust each other and in order for us to trust each other, we have to have that, uh, the thinking of, of being a part of a village in order to raise up that village and protect our children really. So it's really all about the children. And that's the idea behind that. I have a a lot of different partners that's working with me on this um, this goal of ours to create this sustainable community. And then alongside, we're into education, right? Education is a, is a big facet as to how we create this sustainable community. How do we get people in our communities to want to work uh, with each other? Because we've had hundreds of years of, of division and divisiveness that has existed and I know they, Although that it may be, you know, different, it may be like, oh, well, that was our past generation. Well, there's something called epigenetics. <laughs> and that means that it carries on within us. Those experiences carries on within our DNA. So we need to fundamentally retrain or uneducate ourselves in order to re-educate ourselves as to how to come together again, because it's not like it's never been done before. We have to do it in a way that is is sustainable that's going to last for hundreds if not thousands of years from now because we never want to be put in this situation again um and the idea of moors is is not some people would want you to believe because this is why um narrating your own story is important some people want you to believe that the moors were something that was coined by white people labeling african people that's not true Moors, like I'm into um, etymology, I'm, I'm, in, I'm into studying languages, I'm into studying words. Moors was a word that is seen not only in Africa, but in different world, in different, all over the, the continent. You can find it in India, you can find it in Australia, you can find it in the Americas. And you had indigenous groups that identify themselves as MURS, M U U R S, M I R, all different types of things. And what it means. It's not a dark skinned person. It actually means relates to, it depends actually. It can relate to love. It can relate to um, pyramid. It can relate to sun ray beam. It can relate to, or light beam, excuse me. And it can relate to seafarers because you had moors that controlled the seaports back and forth. You can, a person from um, outside of the continent couldn't come into Africa without seeing a moor in, in front of them. It can also mean anchor, right? So it has so many different meanings. It doesn't only attribute to the meaning that white people say it is. And that's the importance of actually going back and checking your references as to what language are we actually speaking. A lot of people think that they're speaking English, 
yeah, we're speaking English, but how literate are we in speaking this language? There's so much we don't know about this language and it was intentionally like written and rewritten. That's why they have different forms of um, dictionary because they change the meanings of words over time. And you have to think that the English language um, came from the Phoenicians, uh, which is also a, a dark group of people. And they had created the phonetic alphabet that came from even more indigenous languages, Meruneter or uh, Nisibidi. So these are these are really um, it's a very it's a very like funny thing to hear when I hear somebody say, oh, the Moors is something that uh, white people coined us and things like that. It's almost like falling into that narrative of saying that um, nigga doesn't have uh, any type of African origin, right? When we have identified that nigga has a relate a correlation with the word niggas, which relates to king and, and queen. And not only that, because that's an Amharic, but a lot of NGs, nig, all of that is in our in, in different African dialects and in different African languages. And, and it can mean a maraud of different things because it's that ing is in our in our um that that type of uh, language. Um, and a lot of times the white people didn't understand the languages. So they just, you know, go off with the here. All right. And I G J A, whatever, nigga. And, and then they create a, a negative connotation around that word when it's in a lot of African languages. Right. So we have to rethink about what has happened to us and, and put critical thinking towards it. Right. So it, it's an interesting world. Right. <laughs> now, when you, Mm, gather some of this information that you gather what do you do with them how do you get it back to the people because i understand that the project is a kind of a give it back you get it and you give it back so tell me about that process right so currently the process is whoever i'm in relations with who i'm partnering with like they get to have privy to that information because they get to know me but i'm actually like a small business so that that's the that's the exposure will be small, but if someone learns this information and passes it on, it grows. We actually run educational programs yearly. So I'm running um, an educational program this summer. Um, and I'm looking to have about 50 youth a part of that educational program. Um, and I'm looking to expand it beyond that because I wanna get actual youth that are on the continent as well. I'm looking from ages uh, 14 to 22 or even 23. And we go through this information of wealth empowerment, one, and then two, social empowerment. So we, we try to debunk these social labels that have been been put upon us by going through the history of how they were created, why they were created. And then I asked my youth, all right, so what, what do you want to be called and, and why? You choose your own identity, right? What, what makes sense to you? Not what you've been told to, to call yourself, but what do you want to be called? What do you ascribe yourself as being, right? Because we don't have to identify with this racial concept because even identifying ourselves within this racial concept is supporting white supremacy supporting it that's how race was even created so that's one thing i run these educational programs and then i'm simultaneously working within within communities where i'm able to disperse this information a lot of people don't understand what more is because it's been so convoluted you know so um that's really how it works. I also have a website where I give out this information and I have a podcast as well. Um, it's called the more podcast where you get to get a lot of this information and yeah. So that's what, what we do. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I understand that you also do a lot of work in, within the area of Afro consciousness, right? Yeah. That, that's a part of my... And I think you have a book that is, the... yeah, yeah, please go. Yeah. I have a, I have a, um, and that's what my curriculum is based off of, of developing African consciousness and trying to get that within the minds of, of other Africans when I'm meeting them. So when I meet someone that's like nearly against saying that they're African, I'm like, oh, hold up, brother. Hold up, sister. Like, let, let's go through this together. Let's see if I can bring you to the dark side a little bit. And we, we go over as to how those negative um thoughts even even were created and try to bring them out of that right 
And it may take a lot of time. Like sometimes when you give people a certain type of information they're not ready for, then they'll just totally reject it. But at least you planted a seed. Um, and, and that's kind of the concept as to the work I'm doing. Even when I have young people join my program, a lot of times they're not ready for the information I'm giving them, but at least I planted a seed. So it'll always be there, you know? Um, I'm also working on a, a manuscript currently, which I'm in the process of publishing is on, it's called Hierarchical Assimilation, um, Play the Game. And it's on basically African people assimilating into this white uh, hierarchical structure and how it, as we assimilate, how it starts to strip away of our cultural identity and what that can do. So I talk about that. And then I also talk about the solutions to, to creating our own communities and building our own empowerment centers for each other and becoming our own agencies for each other as well. Um, but it, it's gonna be different volumes that I create, but this is the first one that I, I am in the process of publishing. Let's go back to where it all began. You were born in, um, in Washington, D.C., right? Say uh, in, you could turn by the hand of time this is today that you were born growing up. What would you want to be taught about Africa? Growing up? Well, uh, what I would want to be taught about Africa is just the realities. I think that I would, I would want to really get a, a better picture as to the, the state that the African people are in um, as far as... Uh, as far as being like frankly told that we're in a in an unseen and unheard of war. We're in a war that people can't recognize because people are so comfortable in the states that they're in. People are so comfortable on their phones that they don't see all the different mechanisms as to how their people are being killed in various ways or being oppressed in various ways and we oftentimes forget. So I, I would want that to be um, addressed to me at a younger age so I could could have spent more time trying to identify solutions for that. Um, I think oftentimes we're teaching our children in obliviousness and I don't I don't think that that's the right thing to do. Um, and also being able to have my children and other children connect at a younger age, um, to on the continent, to be able to understand the culture and vice versa, being able to have the children on the continent be able to connect with people within the diaspora, whether that's them getting outside of the continent, but I think that's really important. Travel, traveling is, is, a, is a human right. It's a humane right for us to be able to travel um, and be able to explore and be able to learn. Right. So I think that's a, a big one. And being able to have that exposure to debunk a lot of negative stereotypes that exist is also something else that would be really important at a really young age. All right. Regarding cultural storytelling, uh, which is the thing that we have discussed today, uh, where do you think uh, African diaspora uh, should be concentrating on in order to um, reawaken our history, to, to retell our story, actually? What do you think we should be concentrating on the more? I think that we should concentrate on um, teaching each other what we know about, about our history and about our own stories, right? Like being open to this idea of communalism and as it pertains to sharing who we are, where we come from, and what our solutions are towards. I think that's really, really important. Um, and then also, like, people have different mechanisms to get to the end goal, like embracing those mechanisms, but trying to throw away this individualistic mindset of, oh, no, this is my story, or no, this is my project, or, this is what I'm doing, you know, like, we have, we can only thrive if we thrive together. So I, I think that's, um, something that needs to be reiterated in this space of, of cultural storytelling with each other. Like it it's, doesn't work if you don't have this Ubuntu mindset. I am because we are. That is true. I am because we are. All right. Um, it is cause of, of the journey that you are, you are in, you know? Mm, you are in, in a lot of things. You are in business, you are in research, you are in storytelling, you are organizing people. You also try to inspire children to believe in themselves in terms of knowing who they are, where they're coming from. Do you want to tell me that do you, you have some challenges or is it all free flow for you? Oh, 
Yes, <laughs> I think with everything you have challenges, but with this one, it, it's a huge challenge because you have to think um, like, <laughs> excuse me, um, the people on in the Americas have a different type of mental bondage than the people on the continent. It's, it's, it has the same root, but it's different. It shows up in different forms. Um, so that, that's a challenge to work with. And it, it's, it's disheartening to work with sometimes because it shows you how much work you have to do, but you can't do it alone. You have to do it with the, with the community. But sometimes seeing the effects on, on the psyche of African people is, it hurts you. It, it gets you to your soul because I, I see people as my reflection. So when I see someone suffering, um, it, it deeply impacts me. And then also seeing people's helplessness, like believing that there's no hope for the African or that the African continent or, or the African communities, um, I get that a lot. You know, some people just have no hope whatsoever because they see how bad things are and they feel like the only thing is to accept it, right? So I, I get a lot of I get a lot of that. Um, <laughs> it's just it's a lot that goes into it. Um, but the helplessness, I, I really I don't tolerate. I don't tolerate that. I don't tolerate that we can't do it or it, it won't happen or it's impossible or it won't happen in our lifetime because it's like that 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 mindset is the reason why it won't happen because you have that mindset you've already decided to give up imagine if you didn't right and imagine if people didn't imagine if all of us didn't that's who our ancestors were they weren't giving up that's how we are existing as we speak that's how we're able to speak with each other because they didn't give up right so how dare we give up you know so I love that. Thank you, sister. I like I like that. That is very important. All right. Now I wanted to tell us about your 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 strength in that despite all these challenges, you are not giving up. You are still fighting. You are going on. What is encouraging you? I mean, what is inspiring you despite all? Um, I think it's the vision I have. I have I'm a very visionary person and I just I see the community that I, I plan on living in and I believe in the power of manifestation. I believe in um, my higher power. I believe in my ancestors. I believe in, in a lot of different things. And honestly, I feel like a lot of the work that I'm doing and a lot of the work that I found is navigated to me from God and from, yeah, God and, and, the, and you know, God's children, essentially, who are my ancestors. So I, I feel like that that is what's really pushing me forward and keeping me going it has put me in all the different experiences that I've gone through and it's a blessing and it makes me live a life of blissfulness despite all the challenges all right now what would be your final statement because we've talked about a lot of important things today talk about um, what you do talk about you where you are coming from um, what would be a final statement from the conversation maybe something you wanted to say I didn't ask you or a kind of a conclusion or a kind of a message please go ahead okay my final statement would be to everyone that <laughs> the struggle continues as in we are in war know that we are in war see the war um identify the war alongside with the enemy and unify with each other mobilize with each other and, and let's get to it let's work we have a lot of work to do we have a lot of strategizing to do we have a lot of organizing to do all right so i want to thank you so much for the time it has been a pleasure on my part thank you so much for having me i really appreciate this you're welcome if you enjoy this podcast make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes rate and review overhead podcast and share with your friends who might need it i remain overhead everyone for Thank you so much for listening and talk to you in the next episode.